I am a venerable bhikkhuni Karunika. Currently, I am residing at Santi Forest Monastery in New South Wales, West, uh, Australia. I am originally from Dhammasaranan Monastery and recently I have come over to Santi Monastery to uh, help grow nuns communities in the east coast of Australia. This side of the continent seems to have a lack of nuns and I have a lot of joy and happiness in my heart to be here, uh, to be of service and also to grow in my own practice. I have been a nun uh, f uh, for about 10 years now and I have been a bhikkhuni for nearly 8 years. And um, I'm very delighted and I have a lot of gladness in my heart as uh, I offer this guided metta meditation as part of a coordinated global meditation program to mark Ajahn Brahm's 70th birthday. I have known Ajahn Brahm for over 20 years and he's somebody who's very special and somebody who is very close to my heart. He has made a very positive impact in my life, and I even doubt whether I would be a nun sitting here right now if it was not for him. I remember a long time ago when I was still a university student, listening to his uh, first Dhamma talk. Of course, I can't remember the content of this talk, but I remember coming out of the Dhamma Loka Center feeling, why didn't anybody else teach me the word of the Buddha like this before? This is so good. It makes so much sense to me. I really understand. And uh, I could comprehend and apply these teachings to my life for the first time. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And uh, really, that was so beneficial and was probably a turning point in my life. Well, it took a many, many years before I actually did a retreat because I was still busy being a young person, studying and having fun. But of course, there came a point when I decided, well, I would like to try out and do a meditation retreat with Ajahn Brah. At that point, I had no idea how to meditate but I signed up for a nine-day retreat. By this time, I have seen Ajahn and known him a little bit, and I know he's kind enough, so he's not going to punish me if I can't meditate. Even if I just ate and slept the whole nine days, I'm sure he won't really, you know, give me a hard time. So I was courageous. So I did a nine-day retreat, and it turned out to be quite good. The teachings were beautiful, and I was able to become peaceful, and then I actually got hooked, and I became one of those med meditation junkies. And uh, Ajahn used to often joke and say, soon she's going to lose her hair and she's going to become a nun. And he was right. It only took about another four years before actually I lost my hair and then I had brown robes around me. And I was I'm very glad that it happened. And I'm very grateful for all that he has done to help and support me, like he has done for so many people. So I have so much gratitude for Ajahn Brown for so many reasons, but one of this, one of them is he, all the energy and all the effort that he has made to reestablish the Bhikkhuni order again. I think after a millennium, it was a thousand years ago when the last Buddhist nuns, the bhikkhunis, died out in Sri Lanka. And it is so wonderful that we have this opportunity available for women again, especially also in the West, and Ajahn Brahm had a lot to do with it. And um, I'm very grateful, and if it was not for him, I probably wouldn't be here as a bhikkhuni right now. 
So I have a lot of gra gratitude and uh, appreciation for all his hard work. And also, I have worked closely with him, trying to do building projects, and I know how hard he works to raise funds and to help and guide us with these things. And he has uh, done that for so many places, like Santi, Damasara, Anukampa Project, Newbury, and many other places, to provide beautiful facilities and conducive conditions so that the women, the nuns, can practice just like the monks. So anybody who have visited these places, Damasara or Santi, you know, these are beautiful pristine forests and the nuns live in little huts somewhere far away and practice, hopefully just like the time of the Buddha, in the same kind of conducive environment which was recommended by the Buddha. And this is a very rare opportunity in the world right now and we have it here and and I'm very grateful for Ajahn for all the work he had done to make it available to us. Also, he gives very beautiful and very uh, profound and helpful teaching and also guidance to us. This is again a very rare, and I even feel very lucky and fortunate. I sometimes think must have had a lot of good karma for us to be able to have all these things right now. He gives beautiful teachings and sometimes, sometimes and often I think, uh, <clears throat> I listen to a talk and I think, wow, he reads my mind and he just spoke to me. This was just what was in my mind and uh, an issue I had and it was beautiful. And then I would share this news with somebody else and they said, no, no, he spoke to me. I also had this problem <laughs> or I had this thing in my mind that I wanted to know about. So he has this amazing ability to speak to people's hearts in a way that you can actually relate to and benefit from. So this is an amazing gift that he can offer to many people. And uh, but m more than that, what I appreciate most is his uh, example. He's actually a very simple monk, even though he's a superstar out there in the world. I have had many opportunities. I've been very fortunate to have many opportunities to see him in his monastery and even spend a rains retreat and to just know him, how he is when he's back at his monastery. He's very humble and he's just like any other monk, just there with everybody else. So he's very simple and very kind. And this too is very inspiring for me. And um, and apart from that, what I really, really appreciate and what I get really a lot of inspiration from is his amazing ability to give. He gives tirelessly and he gives joyfully. He gives with a lot of energy and enthusiasm, 100%. It's amazing to see somebody who is able to give like how he does. And this is a beautiful quality I really appreciate and I could relate to. And um, he has reached so many people, helped so many people, even saved many lives, saved many people who were lost and put them back on track. So for these, I'm very, very grateful and I have a lot of joy in my heart. I rejoice in all these amazing and beautiful things what one person can do. And last but not least, the quality that I really like about him is his playfulness. He's quite playful in the way he practices his own spiritual path and also how he teach and how he encourages us all to do. And I have tried it out and I use it regularly to be playful with my practice. And I find it very beneficial because playfulness uh, gives mindfulness a boost. It makes you alert. It makes you joyous. And uh, it's, it's nice. I find it nice. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be a true disciple of, the, of Ajahn Brahm and going to be a bit playful with this guided meditation and probably do it a little bit different to the traditional way of doing metta meditation. Uh, you're welcome to try it out 
or if not you can just uh, meditate how you usually meditate as well but anyway um, I will certainly uh, try to do something a bit different and playful and fun um, and I also uh, may not keep exactly to the format that I was given by the organizers of this program and I hope they will forgive me and have metta towards me <laughs> for doing that. I'm just um, trying to do what feels right right now and what I feel inspired to do. So uh, before we start the guided meditation, I would like to spend a little bit of time explaining or trying to understand what this uh, metta, the feeling of metta is about. This was a question that I had for many years. I've been trying to think, what is metta? And um, do I have metta? Can I do metta? Sometimes I feel like, oh, maybe I can't do metta. I don't know how to do metta. These were quite common questions, common feelings. There are many, many books written about metta. There are many Dhamma talks by many different teachers explaining in so many ways how to do metta. And yet, for some reason, it was somehow a bit difficult for me to relate to this feeling or try to figure out what this feeling of metta is like. So it's like, you know, you hear descriptions about a fruit that you haven't eaten. Let's say something like mangosteen or rambutan or something like this. But you have to one day eat it and that is when you know it. So in the same way I had this problem of really finding out what is the right description? What is this right feeling? How do I generate metta? And one day, I had this big insight. And this, ha this is how it goes. One day, my little two-year-old little niece came to visit me with her parents. She's only two. And um, she decided to give me a hug herself. So I saw her coming with her hands in the air, running towards me. So I went down on my knees onto the floor to reach, receive her, this little thing. It was just really small and sweet and kind. And she gave me this really beautiful big hug that was full of pure love. Really, really beautiful. I can never recall receiving anything like this. So beautiful, so pure, so innocent and yet full of love. And at that point I realized, wow, this is metta. If this is not metta, what is metta? Then I thought, how did, he, how did she know how to do metta? She can hardly speak. I'm sure she doesn't even know the word metta, let alone having heard any talks or read any books about it. Yet, this little two-year-old knew how to give metta beautifully. And then it also occurred to me, well, I never read any books about how to get angry. I never heard any talks about learning how to become angry. And anger is the opposite of metta. Then I thought, wow, both this metta and its opposite, anger, they both come inbuilt as we are born, as human beings. We both we have these things available to us. And certainly, even when I was young, I would have had these feelings of metta and I would have known how to do it properly. But over the years, as we grow up, our fault-finding mind gathers momentum, we judge everything and judge everybody, and then, you know, encourage getting irritated, agitated. So we so slowly, slowly lose that side of love, but more develop the other side, which is not that wholesome. I'm sure I'm not alone here uh, in saying this, but this is sometimes what happens when we um, grow up. But my little two-year-old niece was my little Dhamma teacher. She uh, reminded me, she gave me that metta again, and I could feel it. And ever since that day, whenever I remember and recall this incident, receiving this beautiful love, beautiful hug from my little niece, I can reconnect to that feeling of metta in my own heart, in myself. 
And that is a great gift, that is a beautiful thing. So I would like to use this little teacher's technique today uh, as a way of arousing metta in our heart. And uh, before we go into arousing metta and getting into the guided meditation, I also want to speak about one other aspect that I had in my mind. And that was, why? what's the purpose of doing metta? Why do we do metta meditation? Because we are supposed to be sitting here, this good person, sending metta, wishing all beings, may they be well and happy. But I wasn't sure whether, when I say may all beings be well and happy, whether they actually become well and happy. Or whether they even want to be well and happy. Does it really work? Or is there any point to doing it? Or is that kind of... I don't know. I had this question in my mind from time to time. So um, <clears throat> one day again, the answer to that came when I was reading Samyutta Nikaya. There is this very beautiful sutta. It's a little sutta, but it's a very profound sutta called Metta Sahagatena Sutta. For those of you who would like to see the reference and read the sutta yourself, it is SN 46. 54. It is in the Bojanga Sangyutta. And it's this really beautiful sutta where the Buddha gives the answer to the purpose of metta meditation in his dispensation. Uh, it's a very profound and deep sutta, so I won't get into the whole sutta, but I will say a gist of the sutta and bring up the point or the purpose that he mentioned. So in this sutta, the monks um, are going on arms round and they realized they were a little bit too early to go on arms that day. So then they decided to go and visit their friends who are of another religious sect. So they visit another uh, temple and then they get into this conversation and those other uh, friends, they say, well, we also practice metta meditation. We also send metta, metta to all beings in the four directions just like how you are doing. So what is the difference between our two religions and our two way of practice? And of course the monks didn't know the answer to this. So they kept quiet. And after they have been on arms round and after the meal, they went and spoke to the Buddha and said, Oh Bhante, this is what happened to us. We went and these uh, other people were also saying that they do metta. And what is the difference between their religion and our religion if we are all practicing metta in the same way? And then at that point the Buddha says, <clears throat> if ever anybody asks you this question, what is the difference between metta that is being practiced? Because metta uh, practice has been a pre-Buddhist practice even long before the Buddha uh, many people knew how to do metta and even many other religions even today do this uh, practice of spreading love and kindness. So it is a common practice. So the question is, what is the difference is th or is there a difference between that way of practicing metta and the way that the Buddha recommends how to practice metta or the purpose of metta? And this is what the Buddha had to say. He says, you should ask anybody who asks this question, Friend, how is the liberation of the mind by loving kindness developed? And what does it have as its destination, its culmination, its fruit, its final goal? In Pali, Kim Gatika, King Parama, King Pala, King Pariyosana. So now I was interested to hear what the Buddha had to say. And this was his answer. He says, in the Buddha's dispensation, the metta is developed in this way. So it is in, in developed, like uh, <clears throat> you develop um, mindfulness, enlightenment factor, satisambhojanga, accompanied by metta. So it's like you have this background feeling of love, kindness, metta in your mind. And together with that, you develop mindfulness. In the same way, you develop the investigation of states, Dhamma Viche Sambhojanga, accompanied by Metta again. In the same way, all the seven enlightenment factors are to be developed accompanied by Metta. And the final goal 
is the final liberation, full enlightenment. That is the purification of the mind. So, now that made a lot of sense to me. So, the person who benefits most from your metta is yourself. And the whole purpose of the way why the Buddha teach metta is to purify our own defilements, to remove our hindrances, and to reach full awakening. And, and as we do that, as we have uh, reduced our defilements and purify our mind, and as we spread this beautiful metta, other beings may benefit as a consequence as well. But that is a secondary thing. But it's a beautiful thing. So never, regardless, we will do it and we can do it. And towards the end of this guided meditation, we'll certainly spread a lot of loving kindness and metta to Ajahn Brahm and to our teachers and our parents and to the whole world. But it is also good to know the main reason is to purify our own minds. So <clears throat> having said that and having um, explored what metta feeling is and also what's the main purpose in the Buddha's dispensation for doing metta. Now we can start the guided meditation. So now I invite you all to sit um, comfortably. You can adjust your posture to how you feel comfortable uh, because we will be meditating for about 20 minutes, maybe half an hour. So find a good relaxed posture. Spend a little bit of time seeing how you can make it more comfortable for you. Slowly bring your mind into the present moment to how you're sitting, where you are. Now I invite you to really bring up a really big sense of gladness in your heart. Glad to be here, to be who you are, and have that sense of goodness, saying, I am a good person. Nobody is perfect. Certainly I have some faults and imperfections, but I'm trying my best. I'm good enough. I'm keeping my virtue, my precepts to my best ability. I have been kind to people as much as possible. I have been generous with my time, with my resources, with my energy as much as possible. These things are rare in the world and I have been able to do these things from time to time. So feel that you are a good person. You are more than good enough. And I also invite you to bring a sense of forgiveness towards yourself. Just understanding we are all still unenlightened and the nature of unenlightened beings is to have defilements. Otherwise we won't be here, we would be fully enlightened. So we are still here because we have defilements. And it's the nature of the defilements to do stupid things from time to time. So we do some things from time to time. But that's okay. That's normal. It happens to everybody. And that's okay. So just, just give yourself a hug. 
just a beautiful hug like the little hug from a little kid and say you're okay and I forgive you tell that to yourself and really mean it it's important and also you can have the same attitude towards to anybody else that who you need to forgive who have you haven't forgiven yet they are the same they also have these defilements they're still here in samsara so from time to time people do stupid things but the buddha said anybody who has these defilements are like somebody who is crazy or somebody who is blind or somebody who is very very sick and in pain so any one of those kinds of people did something bad to you you surely don't mind because you understand either they are crazy that's why they did it or they are doing it because they're in so much pain or they can't see properly so you forgive them straight away so have the same kind of attitude so this is using wisdom as a tool the teachings of the buddha as a tool to really let go of these negative feelings these are defilements so these are gross defilements that we need to purify first before we can arouse metta before we can say may all beings be happy we have to forgive all beings any beings that we still need to forgive and that includes ourselves because all beings include ourselves too and lastly if there is anybody that you think that you need to ask forgiveness from it is important to do that too even though they are not in front of you right now you can imagine that they're here you can imagine that you are asking them please forgive me for whatever silly thing i did i'm sorry say that in your mind and just imagine that they are giving you this beautiful hug full of love and say it's okay i forgive you it's okay i care about you and love you and let the past be and receive that being forgiven the feeling of being forgiven this too is very important really important to receive this beautiful love beautiful hug slowly you can grow a sense of love warmth and gentle by just recalling a beautiful hug that you have received from a little kid or somebody who's very pure and beautiful i'm sure each one of us would have had this kind of experience at some point in our life or would have seen this happen and when you resonate with that you can bring in that feeling of metta and you can allow it to grow inside of you Now I invite you to send a beautiful hug and a feeling of love to your toes. Your toes have been forgotten for a long time, but they have been working so hard. So you can say sorry I have forgotten toes and say thank you. 
and send love towards your toes. And feel your toes receiving this beautiful love from you for the first time maybe. And slowly spread that love to your entire feet. Your feet have been working so hard, walking everywhere, standing, doing so many things. It has been so helpful for you. Have you ever said thank you? This is your opportunity to send a lot of love and say thank you to your poor feet. Slowly spread that love, that warmth, that gentleness up your calves and feel those tight calves Relaxing. Feel them saying thank you to you for giving love and care. Slowly spread love towards your thighs. Relax your back and give blast it with a lot of love and gentleness. Feel your back relaxing, expanding in the warmth of your love. In your kindness, in your heart. Slowly spread love to your tummy, feel your tummy relaxing, bathing in the love that you are giving it. And spread it towards your lungs, which has been working so hard since the first breath it has been working. And spread a lot of love to your heart, which has never missed a beat since you've been born. Working really hard, keeping you alive. Slowly spread that love, that gentleness that warmth to your shoulders and send it down your hands. Slowly bring it up your neck. And feel your neck relaxing, bathing in your love. Bring a smile to your face and relax all the muscles as you give love and gentleness 
to your face. into your head. Feel your whole body saying thank you for giving love and care. Feel your whole body relaxing, becoming easeful, and slowly starting to settle down. Now, if you wish, you can continue the body scan up and down in the same way. Or if the breath has become apparent to you, you can continue to watch your breath again with this beautiful sense of love, kindness and warmth. Now I will be silent for about 20 minutes so you can do your own metta meditation either this way or however you like.
Now we are coming close to the end of this meditation and I would like you to ask the question how does your body feel? Does it feel relaxed and at ease? And how is your mind? Does it feel more peaceful than you began? Is there any joy? Do you feel a sense of love inside? And gentleness? Kindness. So I'm going to end this session by doing a little bit of a chant. And in this chant, uh, a Pali chant, the general meaning of it is wishing people good health, well-being, protection from uh, all dangers, and um, happiness and well-being. So as I do this chant, you can... Um, Visualize Ajahn Brahm sitting in front of you and uh, you can wish him good health, long life, happiness, bring a sense of gratitude towards him. And in the same way, you can do the same for your parents, for all your loved ones, and for the whole world. So as I do the chant, you can do this uh, spreading of metta. And when I stop chanting, that will be the time for you to feel that feeling of metta and direct it towards yourself and give a lot of love to yourself and I will end the session with uh, uh, ringing the gong and at the third ring you can come out so now is the time to again build up a lot of metta by remembering the beautiful hug from a little kid or a beautiful being and spreading that love and kindness starting from Ajahn Brahm to the whole world. Sabha Buddha Nubhavena Sabha Dhamma Nubhavena Sabha Sangha Nubhavena Buddha Ratanang Dhamma Ratanang Sangha Ratanang Tinang Ratananang Nubhavena Chaturasiti Sahas Dhamma Kanda Nubhavena Pita Kataya Nubhavena Jina Savaka Nubhavena Sabete Roga Sabete Bhaya Sabete Antaraya Sabete Upadava Sabete dunimita, sabete avamangala vinasantu, 
ஆயு வட்டக்கோ தனவட்டக்கோ சிறிவட்டக்கோ யசவட்டக்கோ பலவட்டக்கோ வண்ணவட்டக்கோ சுகவட்டக்கோ ஹோ து சப்பதா துக்காரோக பயாவேரா சோகா சாத்து சுப்பாதவா அனேகாந்தராயாபி வினசந்து சேஜசா ஜயசி திதனங்லாபம் சோத்தி பாகியம் சுக்கம் பலம் சிறியாயு வண்ணோச்ச போகம் உத்தீச்சயசவா சத்தவசாயு ஜீவாசித்தி பாவந்து தே Thank <laughs> you.